Please welcome to the stage, Senior Director, Head of Developer Relations at Oracle, Bo English Vichling. Hello, welcome to Oracle Cloud World's exciting Dev Nucleus Space. I'm going to be your MC for today's session. So, the DevRel team is very excited to be the organizer of the Dev Nucleus Space, and we can't wait to show you what we have planned for this year's event. As your champions in this Oracle journey, we want you to have the best experience possible in Dev Nucleus. So if you're wondering what the heck is Dev Nucleus, it's a new space. It's the heart or the nucleus where developers can see some cool things, get hands on with Oracle's products and meet others in the community. We will have learning sessions with experts in the Dev Nucleus space where uh, you can try out new things. And we want things not to only be informative, but fun too. So you're gonna see some incredible technical demos and presentations from some of the leaders in the space, including the creator of CentOS and sessions from amazing open source companies like OpenJS, Mosaic ML, Rocky Linux. And we also have the world's largest Raspberry Pi cluster on site. So you can check out what a 1,050 Raspberry Pis look like up close. Yeah. <laughs> And if you have a Raspberry Pi, swing by our swag station and grab a free Raspberry Pi case. We've also got a great happy hour sponsored by Mosaic ML on Wednesday afternoon, so you can consume a refreshing adult beverage, grab a bite, mingle with us. And in case you haven't heard, Max Verstappen set the track time this morning on the FIA game on the Oracle Red Bull Racing play seats that we have in Dev Nucleus. So whoever beats or gets closest to his time is gonna win some great prizes. All right, so next up, we have a very special guest joining us from the Java One space. Please join me in welcoming one of my favorite people in the world, Sharath Chander. Sharath is a senior director of product management in Oracle's Java team, and he's, his career spans over two decades where he continues to grow and nurture the Java community. One thing I learned about uh, Sharath when I first met him was how important the Java community was to him. And today, he's going to give you a sneak peek into the newly revamped Java One space. Welcome, Sharath. Thank you, Bo. Thank you. Welcome to Dev Nucleus. It's exciting to be here with you today. It's an honor to be invited here to stand on stage. And you might be wondering, why is someone from the Java side of the house here with Dev Nucleus? And the answer is pretty strong and fundamental to Oracle. Oracle runs on Java. Oracle invests in Java. We lead the technology forward. But there's an important part of that investment. And that's the power of community. Community is what drives technology forward. You are influencers as part of that. And what Oracle has done is ensure that we continue to invest in the legacies of the past to enable technologies of the future in modern application development, whether that's in AI and ML, things that touch the cloud, big data. And Java is fundamental to all of that. It spans left and right and deep. And the way we educate each other is by sharing. It's an important part of our responsibility. The developer relations team that drives Java forward are here to connect with you, to educate you, to understand and unleash the potential of where you can take your development skills. And how do we then bridge that between Java and the cloud? Please meet with us, connect with us, share with us so we can bridge that gap. Take that expertise that we do in investing in the Java community and also bring that into the Oracle Cloud environment so we have that shared experience. 
So tomorrow's a pretty important day. Tomorrow we have a technical keynote that's going to go into the many facets of our Java investments, projects that are going to enable and unleash the power of Java for modern application development, touching the many areas from the database to the cloud. We also have a special keynote on Thursday, and that's the community keynote. And that's the celebration of you. It's a celebration of contributions. It's a celebration of connecting and collaborating. It's a way to expand not just our Java community, but our overall developer community, because everyone is welcome. No matter what type of language you use, what type of framework you've implemented, we all touch technology, and it's people that make that possible. So I invite all of you to join us, be part of the Java community, and extend that beyond our boundaries. I look forward to meeting all of you in the hallways, and thank you for having me today. Thank you, Sharath. All right, you guys, it is my honor and privilege to introduce our next guest and keynote speaker, Naveen Rao. Naveen is CEO, co-founder of Mosaic ML, and a recognized expert in the AI hardware field. He was the CEO and co-founder of Nirvana Systems, the first hardware startup for modern deep learning. In 2016, he became Intel's head of AI, which he then grew into his own division. Naveen holds a PhD in computational neuroscience from Brown University and a BSEE in electrical engineering and computer science from Duke University. And before I welcome Naveen to Cloud World, I want to show you a quick video. Since the dawn of time, technology has transformed the way we live. When we all get to use the same tools, the world changes. So why should only a handful of companies get to use the best AI? That's why we started Mosaic ML. We are scientists, engineers, and creators, brought together to give you access to the most advanced AI developer tools. What do you dream about doing? How can you help your customers? What will you make happen today? Mosaic ML turns domain-specific data into unique models that turbocharge your business. Train the most advanced AI models. Achieve more accurate results. Do it faster. Build your next transformation. Good afternoon, everyone. It's, uh, it's kind of nice to be back in real life on a stage. I'm sure everyone has said that, but uh, you know, I guess I'm feeling it now. So um, anyway, I'm really excited to tell you a little bit about um, a company we started about uh, you know, just at the beginning of 2021 and uh, some of the cool innovations we're bringing to market. So it all starts with our team. Our team is really a mosaic of, of creators, researchers, and engineers who care very passionately about bringing AI and machine learning to many different industries. Um, it really shouldn't be in the domain of just the high tech or, or, or finance or whatever. We really want to see AI have a big impact on the world. And we think we can do that best by bringing tools that make it accessible. Accessibility has really two major components, and I'm going to talk about those a little bit today. Um, difficulty or ease of use and cost. Let's just watch this for a moment. While that's playing in the background, I'll just talk through this a little bit. So this is a tool called GPT-3. It's a class of uh, neural network models, or AI models, called large language models. Uh, what this does is it, it can complete sentences or answer questions based upon a prompt. 
And as you can see, I mean, some of the stuff looks quite human um, in, in its response. I mean, if anyone knows the Turing test, this almost seems to pass um, uh, in amazing ways. And uh, this is from OpenAI, who uh, I think was the first ones to come out with this. And then there's another one from, okay, it's, there we go, from Google called Lambda. And actually, this one's kind of fun. Um, I'll let you read it for a second here. <laughs> so there you go. It kind of came up with something that you know maybe a person would come up with. So it's it's actually kind of cool, right? Um, uh, something that is actually generative. It built that on the fly, and it wasn't canned at all. This was something that it came up with on its own, just after being trained on a large corpus of data. So you know, this kind of begs the question: Is AI really intelligence? Actually, this is a, a prominent AI researcher, uh, Ilya Sutskever. He tweeted this, and it caused a big brouhaha, which I always thought was kind of funny. Um, so you know, we can look at some of the errors, really, to see, is, is this uh, stuff really intelligent? So when counting, what number comes before, before 1,000? Correctly says 999 comes before 1,000. But then you say, what comes before 10,000? 9,099. Uh, OK, well, kind of got the concept, but missing, missing some subtleties there. Same thing happens before a million. It actually goes back to the thousands, you know, 900,000. Then it says 99 again. So clearly, there's a little bit of a gap there. Here's another failure I actually think is very interesting. So you know, it's prompted with the question of who was the president in 1700 of the United States? I mean, this is hopefully everyone knows why that's a, a bit of a malformed question. Uh, <laughs> if you don't, maybe uh, you know, I can recommend some history books for you. But uh, it, it, there was no United States, but it still attempted to make an answer. And actually, if you do the same thing with 1650, 1620, 1600, it actually presents names who were in and around the United States in the formation of the United States. So it's actually taking a good guess at who might be the president. The president's an important person for a country, and then those people were sort of around uh, in the sphere. So that's, that's kind of maybe what a child would do if it didn't actually know the specific facts of when the United States was founded. So we're making progress. We're not there probably yet, what one might call AGI or artificial general intelligence. But it's actually doing some really cool things today. So all of this comes with a, a literal cost. So building these kind of models, um, uh, as I mentioned, called the large language models, actually take up a ton of compute. And that comes from the large parameter spaces that those models are, are made of. And so what we're seeing is a trend toward bigger and bigger and bigger. Bigger seems to give you more. It gives you better. It gives you all these really interesting capabilities of, of finding insights and connections within data. And, um, the size of your infrastructure actually matters quite a lot in doing these kind of things. So OpenAI, the one who, uh, who did the first demo uh, that I showed, um, they actually published a blog on scaling to 7,500 nodes. Um, it may sound small for some of the database type stuff, but these are big compute nodes. These are like you know, eight very large GPUs in them with, with two, um, two sockets of CPU and a ton of memory. So these are very expensive nodes. This will actually set you back about $11 billion to build such an infrastructure. So people are investing quite a lot there. Um, Meta, or Facebook AI, is actually another big player here. They've invested a lot of money in research and in a commensurate infrastructure to support that research. And you can see here it says 6,080 NVIDIA GPUs. Um, this first phase, this is like one-third or one-fifth of the total build-out, is something around two or $300 million to build this out. And so you know, these, are gonna, these are approaching the billions. Um, the, what's become very clear is that AI has actually become a very resource-intensive um, uh, pursuit. So we did a little survey um, of some of our Twitter followers. So if any of you are interested, Twitter is kind of the place for ML. Uh, for whatever reason, all the, all the people seem to have gathered on there. So if you want to learn stuff about machine learning, Twitter is the place to do it. Um, and so our followers uh, for Mosaic are actually typically pretty uh, savvy on this stuff. And we asked them, you know, how much do you think it costs to train GPT-3, that first model I, I displayed? And they said somewhere between $1 and $5 million. About 60% of people believed it was, it was in that range um, or more. And so uh, that's, they're, they're published works which say it was $10 million, $12 million, $5 million. Like, it's, it's, a, it's a large number for just one model training run. But one of our core innovations at Mosaic ML is actually 
making that vastly cheaper. And this is something that's uh, core to our development of making things accessible. When something costs $5 million to train, running one experiment, it becomes out of reach for most companies. And they resort to sort of shortcuts that really destroy the quality. And I'll get into why that matters in just a moment. But one thing that we're doing is actually we can train that model that used to previously cost about $4 million for about $400,000. And what's also cool is that we're bringing that down very fast. By the end of the year, we believe we'll, we'll cut that in half. So this is something that we're doing uniquely and, uh, and packaging up so that enterprises can use it. So let's take a step back and understand what are AI models. I mean, yeah, you can build these cool demos and all that sort of thing, but really, what are they? And this is a bit of a new, new way of looking at it, but large language models or large AI models are really databases of sorts. And I don't just say that because I'm at an Oracle conference. Um, <laughs> they, they really do act in this way. And let me just describe what they are for those that are, who are uninitiated. So we start with what we call a naive model. This is basically the description of all the little nodes and how they're interconnected with one another, um, you know, described in, in code. And we start with data. And we basically go through a process called training, where the model sort of fits to the data. It's, it's a little more complicated than that, but we'll, we'll, we'll suffice, that, uh, suffice to say that for now. And you end up with a trained model in the end. So this seems like, I don't know, it's kind of like statistics and line fitting. It's quite a bit different, because you're actually uncovering structure of data. That's what these uh, neural networks can do. So a way to think about this is a trained model is actually organized data. So those who, who are into the database world um, might remember that you know, we start with some sort of structured input, rows, columns, uh, you know, known modalities. And a database has a schema of, of how it can represent that information. And then there's a querying language like MySQL that is very structured in the way it you know, combines columns and that sort of a thing. So now imagine a new world where the input is no longer structured. It's text, it's voice, it's images, it's video. The schema is no longer predefined. It's discovered from the data. And then the query itself becomes also natural and, and flexible. It becomes natural language. I can ask it questions, just like we showed earlier. I can, uh, I can search on images, that kind of a thing. So this is really a new way of organizing data. And we have some cool examples there. Uh, one of our collaborators is a Stanford University research group. They're actually training a, a large language model on um, PubMed, which is you know, a bunch of medical research stuff. And the idea is that we actually want it to pass the US MLEs. If anyone knows what that is, that's the board exam that physicians have to take to be qualified to be a physician. And so by imbuing it with, with information and extracting data and extracting knowledge from that information, we can actually make this thing pass um, a test that humans have to study you know, a good amount for. Another one is a customer that's in the financial services uh, industry. These guys actually used us um, to, I can't get too much of the use case, but used us to um, uh, uh, deal with auto compliance for some of their clients. And this has a real business impact for them. If they're wrong on their compliance checks, they have to eat the cost. So being right is very important. And we got their performance from a kind of below, below par of like 80 something percent to like 96 percent. And that was really, really important to them. And this is not simple. This is like sort of, some people describe it as black magic. It really is just engineering and understanding what's going on under the hood. But that talent is actually uh, far and few between. All right, so what are we bringing as a company? Well, every one of our customers start with data. So the data can be in various modalities, uh, images and text tend to be the big ones that people are dealing with these days. And everybody wants to get to a model, the trained model. And this is, like I said, some kind of a representation of that, of that data set. But doing so is actually quite complicated. It's pretty circuitous, and there's a lot of things you got to think about. Um, these are not topics that are uh, stable either. They're constantly changing and shifting, and we're getting better at training models and making things more efficient. And really, what we do is we sort of bring order to that, and we run it on any cloud. So um, it was inter interesting to me that uh, Larry was talking about you know, the cross-cloud sort of capabilities. Um, I think now maybe I understand why Oracle is so happy that we're actually cross-cloud. We, we are uh, uh, partnering deeply with Oracle for, for reasons I'll show you in just a moment. Uh, but also, we can run anywhere, wherever the customer is and wherever the customer's data lives. 
So how do you use it? Use it? And I'll, I'll get into uh, a little bit of that here. Really, it starts with a YAML file. This is a configuration file where you specify you know, some things about what GPUs you want to run on, how many GPUs you want to run on. Anyone who's actually trained neural networks on multiple GPUs or multiple uh, nodes or systems would actually understand this pain. It's quite difficult. We've made it as easy as literally just changing the number. You can make it 8, or you can make it 8,000. And if we have the resources available, it'll simply run that much faster. We get nearly linear scaling um, in Oracle Cloud because of the way that they've uh, configured their interconnects. Uh, you, you actually put a couple other things like integrations here with uh, ML Ops tools, which I'll show you in just a moment. And, uh, and then basically you say, go. And we have two ways of doing that. We have a, a CLI, a command line interface, where you basically type in um, you know, run, and there's a bunch of other things, options to watch it and things like that. Uh, but you basically submit that YAML file with your model uh, definition, or you can do it from a Python uh, SDK that we've also defined. People use this for, you know, sort of uh, continual learning uh, platforms where they're ingesting new data and kicking off new, new training runs. Then while it's, while it's training, you can actually visualize this with your favorite tools. Um, weights and biases and Comet AI are two very common ones. We have pretty seamless integration there. We also integrate with TensorBoard um, as a free option. It's not quite as good, but you know, it, it gets, you, gets you going. But this is when you can see you know, what's going on with the model. Is it actually converging? Is it hitting the performance metrics that you care about? These are tools for data scientists. And uh, that's, that's what we are. And uh, we build tools for even our own teams internally. So I mentioned uh, we tightly integrate with OCI. And uh, this is actually something we characterize on our own. We, we actually found that OCI is the best foundation. So uh, what you're seeing here on the, uh, on the y-axis is accuracy. So it's like sort of accuracy achieved over time when training a neural network on a, on a benchmark. And then the x-axis on the left is time to get to that accuracy. And on the right is dollars. And so if you take a couple of those data points that are near the 80%, and you sort of compare them between AWS and Oracle, I mean, it's about half the time and half the cost. It's actually a pretty big deal. And these are, this is a tiny benchmark. This is not something that costs a whole lot of money. So maybe you don't care about $200 versus $100. But uh, when it starts getting to be $100,000 versus $200,000, uh, companies tend to care a little bit more. So what are our customers saying? So um, you know, we've, we've gone to market just recently. Actually, today is the first time we're publicly talking about this, which is... Uh, Pretty big moment for us as a company. Um, we, 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 we actually love delighting our customers. We love hearing things like, you know, it's 20x faster. This is what we do. We take pride in the speed, right? That's, that's, kind of, uh, that's kind of our thing. And so we should always do it better than what our customers could have. And it's not that our customers can't. It's that they don't have time to. They don't have, they don't have time to go and, you know, optimize this stuff and make it all work. We, we put it in a box and make it easy for them. And we also want to get them up and running and get them to value very, very quickly. And one of our customers was delighted in that we were able to do something in two days that they thought would take months. So that's pretty cool to see. So in the end, as a company, we believe there's a world where um, it's not one or two models created by a few companies out there on you know, questionable data sets. Right? You might have seen some of that stuff in the news. We believe it's a world where every company can actually build models on their own data. All right, and uh, if you'd like early access to our cloud, please scan that and, uh, and, and visit our website and tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, we have a couple of developer workshops and, uh, and other events uh, tomorrow and Thursday, and we also have a uh, happy hour tomorrow night. And so come by our booth, find out more information, and uh, we'd love to, love to talk to you about your machine learning problems. And uh, with that, I thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Naveen. That was an amazing presentation. And next, we're going to have what I like to call a panel of big brains. So I'm pleased to introduce you to our panel guest, Warren Jones from SailGP and Ann Brunton from Oracle Red Bull Racing. Warren is the Chief Technology Officer at SailGP, which features the fastest and most technologically advanced sail race boats in the world. And Jones works with Global Partner, aka us, and innovative solutions for remote broadcast production, data management, and distribution, the award-winning SailGP app, and the Umpire app for race management. He also supports the event and office infrastructures both in London and New York and at each of the global 
Grand Prix events. Prior to CLGP, Jones was head of information technology at the America's Cup Event Authority in Oracle Racing. And our next big brain is Ian, the application development group leader at Oracle Red Bull Racing. He heads up multiple software development teams that together build the front end applications, which underpin the engineering and racing parts of the business. The applications that he's responsible for ranges from data processing systems in the wind tunnel to set up tools tracking every component fitted on the car. In addition, to supporting the Oracle Red Bull Racing Team in their Formula One Championship endeavors, Ian and his team provides expertise to the Young Driver Development Program and supports Red Bull Advanced Technologies. Prior to his career in motorsport, Ian worked across central government in the defense, security, and intelligence sectors. So welcome, Ian and Warren. Hi, babe. Hey, how are you? Thank you. Have a seat, you guys. Thank you. All right. So, a couple of things, you guys. While I was preparing for this panel, I wanted to learn a little bit more about the two of you. So, I Googled you. And what I discovered was absolutely fascinating. So, first off, let's start with some simple questions about you and your background, both of you. Ian, I Google stalked you, Ian Brunton, on uh, Google search. And the first thing that pops up is your LinkedIn profile. Literally no social media. Nothing interesting, nothing fun. Just work-related stuff <laughs> only, right? So what I'm feeling is you don't have much of a social life going on here, <laughs> right? My, uh, my social life pretty much outside of work revolves around my kids. So you're not missing a huge amount. It's, uh, it's essentially taking them to martial arts lessons or swimming or ballet. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, you're about, about right. about family. <laughs> you like to sit in a dark corner and code? Uh, not really, no. I think no. this is my kind of thing. Like, I love this kind of stuff. Um, I mean, as, as you can see from my awesome T-shirt. I love this T-shirt, uh, by the way. I can but write code. We have to show the audience the back of the t-shirt. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Should we do you that? guys, are you ready for this? Can you see? I don't know if... Okay. You <laughs> might have to read it out. Just in case you guys cannot see this. It says, eat, sleep, Red Bull, drink, race, win championship. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and uh, uh, Warren, I was Google stalking you, uh -oh. and uh, I said, Warren Jones, Sale GP. And there were like five million search results for you on Google search. Uh, that all one true. about, well, yes. <laughs> and one about a Warren Jones foundation. Then I find out this is not the same Warren Jones. <laughs> Unfortunately, this is a completely not. different Warren Jones. <laughs> so my question to you is, why do you not have a foundation named after you? Uh, well, when I leave this building, I'm going to set one, set one up straight away. <laughs> And Ian, I found this interesting work article about you. It's on leadership. And one of the quotes says, understand how people work. Begin to read the signs of people from their body language, not just their words. So looking at Warren, what does his body language say to you? Oh, you put me on the spot now. So, I mean, yeah, absolutely. The words in a kind of communication transaction are important, but you have to focus on the body language. If you're only using the words, then you're probably less than 10% efficient of actually what you're getting out. Yeah. For Warren specifically, uh, your hands are in a really good position. You know, you seem quite cool, you're calm. Your eye contact is great. And what that tells me is that if we were to have a conversation in work, you know, let's say there's a performance issue or something like that, we can be a lot more direct with each other than someone who Interesting. potentially is, you know, different body language, implies you can have the same conversation, but just in a completely different way. And Warren, when I was Google stalking you, uh, I assumed that you were a ginormous fan of sailing. So tell us, how did sailing win your heart and how did you get involved in that? It was an extremely long time ago. Um, so I, I worked with, um, I've been working with Oracle a long time with uh, the America's Cup and Oracle Racing, uh, Oracle Team USA. 
So uh, from that point, um, I, I enjoy sailing. I'm not a very good sailor, so I'm going to say that straight away. Uh, but as a pastime, I, I, quite, I very much enjoy it. Um, I'm more of a G&T guy, putting my feet up on the boat rather than the, what the, the, the athletes do now on a SailGP F50 is a little bit different to what I think uh, I, I call sailing. Amazing. And Ian, you, would, were you a fan of Formula One before you started working at Red Bull? I, I would describe myself as kind of a semi-fan. You know, I, I sort of knew who the drivers were and I knew who was winning the championship, but I wasn't a die-hard fan. And so maybe what you might want to share with the rest of us is what kind of car do you drive? Me? Oh, well, there's some pretty cool cars in the factory. You know, I'd, I'd love to say that I was turning up to work in a Lambo every day, but <laughs> sadly, this is not the case. Uh, so I drive an Audi, which on the outside is, looks nice, but on the inside is mostly full of half-eaten snacks and kids' toys. <laughs> All right, you guys, before we get to more serious questions, I thought that we could have the audience get to know you a little bit better. So, folks, have you guys ever heard of two, uh, two Lies and a Truth? So we're going to play a little bit of a variation on that, and I'm going to call it Two Lies and One Truth, or Two Truths and One Lie. We'll switch it around. Anyway, so uh, we have a pigeonhole app that uh, we're going to be using, and We've asked Warren and Ian to provide three statements. So, if you would like to ask a question, there are instructions that are gonna be shown behind me on how to do that. So, the, please go to the Oracle uh, Events mobile application, locate this session, which is the SOL3889, scroll to the ask a question, and then vote. So, we're going to share three statements. You have to figure out which one is the lie. All right, you guys, I'm going to give you one minute to get going. And then, as you get to this and start voting, we're going to start seeing results on the screen so that you can actually see how the audience thinks. Are you guys ready? Everybody in? Maybe. All right. Let's start with you, Ian. OK, so I was once stranded overnight in the African savannah and got rescued by a group of American tourists in their 60s. I once got sprayed, I mean, like, soaked with champagne on the F1 podium. And I didn't have a time for a shower on the way home, and the, uh, the guy next to me was not best pleased. Uh, I met my wife at a jiu-jitsu black belt grading, and she kind of broke my arm. All right, you guys, so the goal is, which one is the truth? Please start voting in the app. Oh, Ian, they think you got your arm broken. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're going to have 30 more seconds, maybe. All right, folks. 15 seconds. Let's see. All right. Voting time is up. Let us go to which one is the truth? The truth is number one. I once got stranded overnight in the middle of the African savannah and got rescued by a lovely, lovely group of American ladies in their 60s. <laughs> okay, but you have to share a little backstory about this. How did this happen? <laughs> So, uh, so me and my wife hired a 4x4 and we went out and did a self-drive safari. So it's, you know, it's a big 4x4 truck with a tent on the roof, just us in the middle of nowhere. And we drove out one evening to go and kind of see a watering hole. And on the way out, there was a, a big black puddle on one side of the, of the path and a sort of nice 
path on, on the left. And so uh, I got it into my head, stay, stay right stay right because it, uh, it you know that's where the good road is and so we went out to this watering hole had a look round, and then came home and as I was coming back I just kept it in my mind stay right and drove straight into this enormous puddle when the water was just straight up above the wheels and that was it we were stuck and, uh, and a group in their 60s rescued you yeah so <laughs> about three hours later this kind of lovely lovely group of little old ladies came by in, uh, in, in their sort of truck from the local, local hotel and tried to pull us out and they couldn't um, so we were going to be stuck overnight and thank goodness they convinced their driver to come back the next morning otherwise well I'd still be there now I think this would be very bad <laughs> yeah thank you Ian all right we're moving on to Warren so Warren tell us your three statements um, so away from work which is not that much. Uh, I could be found cheering on Manchester United, which is a UK Premier League football team. Um, I didn't know how to sail uh, or had uh, any, um, sorry, I didn't know how to sail or had any competitive, 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 competitive I can't even say it, competitive race prior to joining SailGP. I met Elon Musk line dancing in Austin and lost a dance off. <laughs> All right, you guys. Please go to the Pigeonhole app and pick which one is the truth. Oh, this is looking like it might be number two. <laughs> but that one looks so obvious. So obviously not right, right? Maybe. All right, you guys, a couple more seconds. Anyone else? All right, let's reveal the truth. Uh, Which one is the truth, Warren? Uh, number three. No, no, it's, it's not, it's number two. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe that you never knew uh, or never sailed or competed in any sort of competitive racing before. Just leisure. Just, I told you, g &T. That is just craziness. Well, you guys, that was amazing. So, let's go on to a slightly more serious note. Uh, so, as the leader of the engineering team in Oracle Red Bull Racing, Ian, I understand you're responsible for both the framework and design of the actual F1 car. Is that right? Tell us about that. Uh, you're almost right. So we're involved kind of indirectly. So, so my team builds all the software that's used by kind of engineers across the business. So this is aerodynamicists, uh, engine designers, vehicle dynamicists, so, you know, people that understand suspension systems. Um, they use our software to run a range of simulations that helps confirm whether their design is correct or not. Awesome. And Warren, you're CTO of CLGP. Could you share a little bit about what you and your teams do? Um, it's a big question. So, you know, we're the global championships. We have events all around the world. Um, our next event is in Dubai in a, in, a, in a couple of weeks' time. So to move that boat and nine of them around the world and then get the information from there, we generate around uh, 48 billion data requests every afternoon and making sense of those 48 billion data requests to to make the boats go faster, to make the athletes make better decisions, and also um, for our fan engagement and also broadcast as well. So we need to give that out to, for our broadcast to be able to tell people what's going on. So a broad question, but yeah, lots going on. Yeah, so when I was watching one of the sailing races, there are app apparently 30,000 sensors on the uh, sailboats, and not only are you you know, thinking about the wind, but you're also thinking about the water, other uh, sailboats, for example, what's happening in the front of the boat, what's happening on the back. There's apparently cameras everywhere. How are you ingesting all of this data? So everything goes from the, the, the boat to, um, a, we use an Oracle Fast Connect, so everything's in a data center in London. So even if we're in Sydney, we, we send everything back to, to, to London from that point of view. Um, and we're around 100 milliseconds from boat to database, um, which people keep on telling me that's too slow. So we need, we need to go faster, but 
keep on talking about light and, 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 and fibers and things like that. So, but we'll, we'll get there. But it, it's, uh, it's a lot of information, and we use Oracle, Oracle Stream Analytics, Oracle Cloud Analytics to be able to find those metrics and be able to make those decisions faster and quicker. That's wonderful. I'm super, super glad, obviously, that OCI is helping you with this. Ian, tell us, how is OCI helping Red Bull Racing achieve world championship twice? Yeah, so there's kind of, there's sort of two areas in which uh, Oracle are helping us out. So one is in our engine development. So we have a new powertrains system. So powertrain is just a fancy pants word for engine. So we set up this new business in the last year or so. And it was genuinely, you know, this space was a car park a year ago. Now it's a building running an engine on a dyno. And the only way we've done that is by leveraging the flexibility of, of the OCI cloud been able to run CFD simulation of actually designing the engine itself. Amazing. And yeah, it's, it's just groundbreaking. And then at the other end of the business, we kind of use OCI in race strategy. So on the kind of high pressure decision making at the track, we use uh, OCI cloud to run literally billions of simulations to give us uh, uh, optimum strategy. And what was the one big problem or area where you were looking to solve and OCI was able to solve that for you? It's really flexibility. So, you know, this example of, um, of the powertrain business, it's essentially like a startup. So we went from almost, you know, nothing to a, to a business now that's, that's um, you know, built an engine. And specking what you need from a hardware perspective at the beginning of that journey is really quite challenging. Whereas if you can just add resource as and when you need it, it really helps you grow in the right direction. Fantastic. And Warren, what about you? Same, same question. Um, if, if, you, if you look previously, we, were, we, we used to travel with the equipment. Uh, it used to be on, off, and, na and now having a, a data center, we're an always-on uh, system. So having the ability to, to, to go back and rerun races, having the ability to, to, to use anomaly detection to, to find out uh, uh, problems with the boat before that even happened is, is, is really, really cool. And um, you know, the, the huge amounts of data we're working on We've probably future-proofed ourselves a little bit, but we've added a lot more sensors that we shouldn't have done. But we know that in the future, there's these questions that are going to come to us and say, OK, we need to do this or we need yeah. to do that. And hopefully, the, the added extra sensors and the added extra information will be able to help us push that forward. Can you give us an example of a sensor, maybe? Well, um, no, but no. <laughs> <laughs> Is this a top secret? <laughs> you know, we, 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 to use to, for a pun, you know, we want to push the boat as, as fast as possible and uh, um, uh, using that. But with CLGP as well, we're, we're sustainability at heart and we want to look at that. And over the past couple of months, we've been putting sensors on the boat that doesn't make the, go, the, boat, the boat go faster. It actually measures the sustainability of what's around, water temperature, tide, information that we give then to local authorities to say, OK, this is, this is granular information about what you, in your, in your area. And therefore, then we can come back. They can, they can have full access to it. We can compare it when we come back then the following year. So we're trying, to, we're trying to be as sustainable as possible as well. Fantastic. All right, you guys, we have a couple minutes left. And I think we might have a question from the audience. You guys. So let's see. What do we have? Oh, here's an anonymous question. What has been the most surprising impact from technology for Oracle, Red Bull Racing, or CLGP? And I'll start with you. Um, I think really the, the race strategy um, example we were talking about earlier has really been useful in, in pretty much every race we've run this year. But you know, some specific examples, I think, uh, um, are in Miami. So this was a brand new track. We'd never raced there before. There was no data to tell us you know, what a, a good strategy would look like from previous years. Right. And by, now, by being able to run our strategy simulations on the cloud, we could have confidence in the decisions that we took at the time. And how confident are you now? Of winning the championship? I'm, <laughs> I'm pretty confident. <laughs> <laughs> and Warren, what about you? What's the most surprising impact from technology? Um, we use Oracle Fast Connect to extend the data center, uh, the data center uh, into our venue and having the ability for people not to travel, to be able to do the work from London or from 
uh, Sydney. So we, we, we do a remote production, so everything is back in London. And we even have our umpires who are officiating on the race. They're, they're calling the shots on, in London when we're in Sydney or we're in Dubai from that point of view. And that's all built on, all, all that software is built on the Oracle Cloud. So the ability to, to call a, a decision for a boat 5,000 miles away is, is just tr truly amazing. So, yeah. Fantastic. I'm glad to hear it. All right, you guys, we are out of time. Thank you so much, Warren and Ian. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you, Bay. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, folks, we have a couple of surprise announcements uh, that I would like to share with you. Uh, one is we're launching a new developer community called Luminaries. This community is going to be for any developer or aspirational developer interested in up-leveling their skills, learning new cloud and open source technologies, and learning from others. You're going to have a chance to meet and engage with product and engineering leaders building Oracle technologies that you use. You'll get access to exclusive technical content free cloud credits to build your apps, and you'll be the first to know about product launches and opportunities to become beta testers. We also know that fun things are important, so you'll be excited to know that you're gonna be invited to some fun events we hold with exclusive physical and digital swag. To sign up, please check out this link or scan the QR code. Also next up, I'm very excited about this one. It's been in the works for a little while, and I'm pleased to announce that we've revamped the developer.oracle.com site, and I think it looks gorgeous. So our previous platform made it a little challenging for us to share with you our code, integrate with developer tools such as GitHub, show illustrations or animations, or enhance search capabilities. This new platform is gonna change all of that, and there's more enhancements coming in the next few months. So please check out our website at developer.oracle.com. And we want you to know that we are listening. So join our community on Slack and let us know what other enhancements you'd like to see. Couple of housekeeping announcements, you guys. There is a welcome reception happening right at the end of this session. A ping pong tournament happening tonight. A Java One run happening on Wednesday morning. A Mosaic ML happy hour happening tomorrow afternoon at 4.30. The Cloud World Party is happening Wednesday evening. And our closing ceremony is happening Thursday at 1.40. So here's a little bit about the Mosaic ML happy hour, 4.30 to 5.30 in the developer hub in Caesars Forum. And I did mention this already, but just in case you did not hear this, please check out the uh, track time that Max set earlier today. And if you beat him or get close to beating him, you do get a prize. And don't forget, you guys, hoodie is over in the Venetian. Please pick up your conference hoodie. And the last thing is we'd like to hear from you. So please check out our survey and give us an evaluation and let us know what you think. Thank you.